All right, I hope you all enjoyed the meal. And uh, we're going we're gonna to get some more, more food here, some spiritual food by Pastor Buttery. Uh, we sure have appreciated his message uh, thus far. We have, a, have uh, two more presentations, this one and immediately to follow. He might give us a break and have us stand up and stretch or something like that, but, uh, uh, but uh, we've been blessed by his message uh, so far, and I know he will continue to bless. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we thank thee again for this day, and we, we thank you for the ministry of Pastor Buttery, your faithful servant. We, we, we thank you for your giving him safe journey here and blessing his presentations this Sabbath. We ask that we that, that continue, uh, speak through him, and again, we thank you for all that you do for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lee. All right, good evening. I mean, good afternoon, not evening yet, is it? Trust you had a, a good lunch. Food was uh, satisfactory. It was uh, enjoyed. Uh, enjoyed the spread and uh, the hospitality was fantastic and just a blessing. Whenever I do seminars, I just and I didn't mention it at the end of the worship service, but I should have warned you all: don't eat too much because <laughs> we have uh, those that endure to the end shall be saved. We've got a little bit more to do here this afternoon and. Uh, but I, I trust you'll be, uh, you'll be blessed and encouraged uh, in uh, a couple more presentations we'll be giving, which, of course, all have to do with the time in which we live. And if we understand Bible prophecy correctly, um, we understand that we are living in what uh, is, is known as, and, and, and in uh, different places could be known as something else, but the sealing time. The ceiling time, and uh, and I really want to talk with us uh, this eve- this afternoon about the time of the end, the time of the end. Um, now, you do you know the difference between the time of the end and the end of time? <clears throat> Farmer Brown has a turkey, and maybe a few turkeys, and Thanksgiving is around the corner, so. Uh, Farmer Brown is feeding his turkey uh, a little extra food and a little extra fat. He's, he's getting his turkey ready. Uh, at that particular time, uh, the turkey is living in the time of the end. And then it's the, this Thanksgiving Eve, and Farmer Brown needs to do what he needs to do. And he goes out to where the turkeys are, the turkey pen, and he has an axe in hand or whatever he has. And now that turkey is living at the end of time. So that's the difference. The time of the end really prophetically deals with the sealing time. God readying a people, getting people ready for his soon and imminent return. So I want to talk with you this afternoon about the time of the end and the implications of that on our lives. And I want to try to make it, uh, there's going to be some theory, of course, but I want to try to make it as practical as possible. Um, when I came to these United States, uh, there uh, was a phrase that I heard that was connected to one of Americans' favorite pastimes, football. And the phrase was uh, the two-minute warning. I've never heard that expression before. Um, we don't have gridiron as uh, you have it here uh, back home in Australia. We have real football in Australia. They don't wear pads. They don't wear shoulder pads. Help, just brutal anyway. But um, you know that here in these United States, and, and of course the Super Bowl just uh, has come and gone, and to some people and many people, they're thankful that it's gone. Um, you heard a lot about the two-minute warning, and you know, any, any, if you know anything about football, and you know anything about the two-minute warning, you know this: that when they give the two-minute warning, especially at the end of the game, that's all the time that's left to play, essentially. So, if you are ahead in the game, what do you need to do? You need to stay ahead. Uh, if you are behind in the game, what do you need to do? 
You, you need to catch up. You need to crawl back and, and gain some, uh, get some touchdowns and, and some field goals. You need to get ahead. So the two-minute warning really uh, encourages the team to manage the clock, uh, to recognize how close they are to the end, and they had to give the performance of their life, so to speak. It's a time of urgency. Why? Because time is almost over. That's really what we're talking about. So when you study the Bible, the Bible sounds a two-minute warning, if I could put it that way. Uh, Bible prophecy declares that there is a two-minute warning for the human race. And so if you have your Bible, and we're going to put the text on the screen, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 provides a magnificent picture of uh, an event that is absolutely riveting. And so uh, we'll read it here for you. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, or the court was seated, and the books were open. The Bible says that every human being will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we know that this particular judgment that we read about in, in Daniel chapter 7, we know that this judgment takes place prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. We know that because over in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, we're told, uh, John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To how many people? To everyone, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And what does this angel say? Fear God, give glory to him for what? The hour of his judgment is come. And then the, it's, there's a call to worship the creator who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the springs of water. And so we know that this judgment takes place prior to the return of Jesus because this is the everlasting gospel. And Jesus says that when the, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, then what happens? The end will come. Jesus will come. And so the everlasting gospel goes to everyone and then Jesus returns. And you read this later in Revelation 14, uh, verse 14, when Jesus is seen coming with a sharp sickle to harvest and gather the righteous uh, there waiting for his return. And so when you come over to Daniel chapter 8, and I'd like to invite you to turn there with me because we'll just uh, take a little look here at a few things this, uh, this afternoon before we get to some main points. Daniel chapter 8, we find that God provides a starting date for this judgment. God provides a starting date for this judgment. We talked about it last night, but I'm going to go into just a bit more detail uh, with you. This, uh, we know that this isn't the return of Jesus that it's speaking about because no man knows the day or the hour. But we do know it's talking about the judgment, a date for the judgment. And the announcement that we are living in the day of judgment adds impetus to the, to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. So it adds extra inspiration, if, if you please, that, with regard to Jesus' return. So I'm not going to thoroughly lay this out for us this afternoon, but I want to show you in brief how we arrive at the date 1844 and then talk about the time of the end with you and the implications of that. So Daniel 8 really is a story about a vision. Uh, it's a, a fantastic vision, in fact. Uh, but there was a part of this vision, as I mentioned last night, that could not be understood. Uh, there are parts of the vision that are clearly understood, and there are parts of the vision that are not understood. The vision begins with a ram battling against a he-goat, uh, a male goat. And the meaning of the ram and the he-goat are given actually in the chapter, verses 20 and 21. If you don't know anything about history... Uh, and you don't know which nation followed which nation, you at least get to understand uh, about two or three different nations in this chapter and who followed who. It's fascinating. And so here you have uh, the kingdoms of, and you read this in verse 20 and 21, the kingdoms of the, of the Medes and Persians and then the kingdom of Grecia or the Macedonian Grecian Empire. The male, uh, the male goat, which is Greece, according to the prophecy, is victorious. 
But the vision tells us that there is a notable horn, and we recognize that to be Alexander the Great. And that horn is broken up into four parts. Interestingly, specifically, uh, Alexander the Great, when he died at a very young age, uh, 30s, uh, his kingdom was divided among his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And so here you have that one notable horn broken up into four, the division of the Grecian Empire. Then out of some winds, as you continue reading the prophecy, a little horn arises. And it's very interesting. This little horn would end up persecuting God's people, magnify himself to the Messiah, and cast down truth to the ground. This horn symbolizes, uh, as the two prophecies preceding this prophecy, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, it represents Rome. But it also doesn't just represent the Roman Empire. It represents Rome in its two phases, pagan and papal Rome. We know that papal Rome was a dominant player at the time of Jesus. Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. Jesus was buried in a tomb with a Roman seal. Romans, uh, Rome was a very prominent player in the days of Jesus Christ. We also know that it must be Rome in its two phases, of course, because when the question is asked in Daniel 8, verse 13, just proceeding, because we're going to get to verse 14, verses, uh, verse 13, uh, 12 and 13, the question is asked, how long are these atrocities to take place uh, here on planet Earth with regard to what the little horn is doing? The answer comes back in Daniel 8, 14, And it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, you know that in prophecy, a beast represents a nation, and water represents people, multitudes, and a day represents a year. That's right. Now, we know that this cannot be literally 2,300 days. That's about six and a half years. It's impossible for all of these things, uh, Greece and Rome, to rise to power in six and a half years. It didn't happen. It certainly didn't happen. So we already know that this is not literal days we're talking about. We're talking about, liter- we're talking about years. And on top of that, if you go down to verse 17 in chapter 8, it tells us that this vision wouldn't be until the time of the end, interestingly. And verse 26 tells us that this vision won't, won't be for how many days? many days into the future. It would extend all the way down into the latter days of Earth's history. Now, verse 27 tells us that Daniel didn't understand the vision. Daniel didn't understand the vision, but it couldn't be all of the vision because the angel explained some of it, like who the ram was and who the he-goat was, etc. So we know that, that he understood those things, but there was a part of the prophecy that he didn't understand And what was that part of the prophecy he didn't understand? For those who were here last night, you know. If you weren't here last night, you know. Then you know. He's referring to the prophecy, the prediction regarding the evenings and the mornings. He didn't understand the 2300-day prophecy. It just blew his mind. The Bible says he was sick certain days. This thing was overwhelmed Daniel to the extent he was not well. But it's not until we get to Daniel chapter 9 that the same angel who came to Daniel in chapter 8, Gabriel appears to uh, Daniel again. And he returns, according to Daniel chapter 9 in verses 21 and 23, he returns to give Daniel skill and understanding with regard to the vision of the evening and the morning. And which is the, what is the vision of the evening and the morning? The vision of the evening and the morning is the 2300 day evening morning prophecy you see. So let's look at Daniel 9, verses 24 and 25, and notice what it says. Gabriel, uh, we recognize that Gabriel is the angel here, and we recognize he's about to give an explanation that provides, uh, while it provides another time prophecy, we know it's connected to Daniel 8, because number one, it's another time prophecy, but also he's coming to give him understanding regarding the vision of the evenings and mornings, the evening and morning. So we know Gabriel is referring to Daniel 8, 14. So we look at verses 24 and 25. 70 weeks are determined for your people, Israel, for your holy city to make the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation uh, for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks, the street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. Now, we are not going to take a look at this 70 week or 490 year prophecy. But what suffice to say is this smaller prophecy is cut out from the larger one. And the starting time for this prophecy is the exact starting time for the 2300 year prophecy. And we know that the beginning of this prophecy, according to what we just read, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And according to history, and you can read Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel, Ezra chapter 7, we understand it was the third uh, Persian king, Artaxerxes, or the third decree which Artaxerxes gave that, uh, that fulfilled this prediction because Artaxerxes' command uh, met the specifications of uh, Jeruz- Jews going back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and they were given the opportunity to reestablish their laws and civil government and really it cap- encapsulated this particular prediction. And that command was given according to history 457 BC. So that's how we arrive at the beginning date for the 2300 year prophecy. And it's very clear the connection between Daniel 8 and 9. I've just given you two basic connections, but there are many other connections. One, as I mentioned, Gabriel comes to give him understanding, referring to the visions of the evening and morning, the one he didn't understand. Uh, clue number one. Clue number two, it's the same angel, Gabriel. He's, he shares with Daniel in Daniel 8. Now he's back in Daniel 9. And of course, we're dealing here with time prophecy. So there, those are three, and there are others, connections between these two chapters that help us see that the starting date for the 2300 days, years, is the same starting date for the 490 or the 70 week prophecy. I hope that's clear to us here this morning. So if you're taking 457, if you're taking 457 uh, BC and you add 2300 years, taking into account there's no zero year, what year does that bring you to? A little bit of math and cheating by looking at the screen behind me, you'll notice that brings us to the date, the year 1844. We are told that Daniel 8.14, Daniel 8.14 is the foundation and the central pillar of the Adventist faith. We need to, if if we don't understand anything, we need to understand this. It's the central pillar and foundation of the Adventist faith. And we're also told that this message gave the message, this, this uh, Daniel 8, 14 gave the message, the everlasting gospel, character and power. Character and power to our work. So the question is, why? How could this a date that deals with numbers and calculating things, how could this give character and power to our work? Good question. So since we're living in Earth's final two-minute warning that judgment has been underway for uh, technically 179 years, when we get to October 22, it will be 180 years, we recognize that Jesus is coming soon. Now, I just want to ask a, answer a question because it does come up uh, among, even among Adventists, 1844. Wasn't that such a long time ago? I mean, how does a date that long ago in the mid-19th century have bearing on us today? I mean, it's so long ago. Maybe that's a fair question. Maybe maybe for those who've studied and have dug a little deeper, maybe you understand that this wasn't so long ago. Keep in mind that 1844 is really the clearest sign that Christ is coming soon. Why? Because 1844 spells the beginning of, of the judgment process, that judgment has already begun. And if the final judgment has already begun, then surely we have reached the last days. It can't go on forever, you understand. Judgment will come to a conclusion. So we we acknowledge that it was 179 years ago. um, And we recognize that that was a long time ago, but perhaps we can just change our perspective just a little bit. So I'm going to share a few things with you to help us do that this morning, this afternoon. So instead of looking at 1844, uh, back to 84 and finding it 179, 180 years in the past, let's go back to the start of human history, 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years and look from the future. So from the days of Adam and Eve, 
From the days of Adam and Eve, when the first promise was made regarding the coming of the Messiah, unto the cross that Jesus died on for you and for me, how many years was that? Roughly 4,000 years. Roughly 4,000 years. When we arrive at Noah's day, from Noah's day to Abraham's time, we've come to about 2,000 years. About 500 years after Abraham, we've only reached as far as the Exodus. 500 years is nearly twice the age of these United States of America and is just under three times the chronological distance between 1844 and 2024. Not seeming so long ago, is it? Then 500 years after the Exodus, do you know which king we come to? King David. And then 500 years after, Dan after David, we come to the prophet Daniel. And then from Daniel's day, Daniel Babylon is followed by Medo-Persia and Medo-Persia by Greece and Greece by Rome and then the breakup of the Roman Empire. Uh, then we go another 500 years and we reach the starting date of the great 1,260 year Bible prophecy, 538 AD. And then we have nearly 1,000 years uh, to go before we reach Europe's discovery of the Americas in 1492. And approximately another 300 years to the Declaration of Independence. Then finally, as if we would never reach them, the three angels, three angels bearing a precious and present truth message. And underneath the pillar of them is engraved 1844. Finally, we get there. So from the perspective of Eden, the remaining distance from 1844 to 2024 is hardly discernible. In fact, these 180 years, 179 years represent only 3% of human history. 97% of human history is already over and done with. So we're in the end. We're in the time of the end. There's no question about it. The final judgment only began yesterday, as it were. And Christ's coming is soon. And we haven't taken the time here to even talk about those things that prop up the, the, this particular time. We've mentioned the great 1260-year prophecy, which is like a colossal monument, towering gatepost uh, passed with human history entering into the time of the end. There are other prophetic uh, fulfillments that add stature to 1844. For example, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. The dark and bloody moon, dark day and bloody moon of May 19, 1780. The falling of the stars in November 13, 1833. All of these were predicted in Matthew 24 and in Revelation 6. And then we think about the contemporary signs all around us, like the, pro the prominence of the papacy and the popularity of Pope Francis. His address to the United States Congress, incredible. Calls to honor Sunday, the unity that's forming between Protestants and Catholics alike, the erosion of America's fundamental freedoms, and we can just go on and talk about the signs that are staring us in the face. And so the Bible says, under 2,300 days in Daniel 8, 14, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What's the sanctuary? What's the sanctuary? The sanctuary being referred to, in the Bible, there are two sanctuaries. Can anyone tell me what they are? There is the great original, where? In heaven, that's right. And it was the one in heaven that Moses received a blueprint of to build the one here on, on earth. And so there's one in heaven, the great original, and there's one on earth. And I'm not going to tell you today that they both are exactly identical because the one that Moses made was made with uh, materials and goat's hair and badger skin. And the one in heaven certainly is not made of those things. We understand that. But it's the great original in heaven. And then the one on earth was the portable structure that Moses built. And then there was a more permanent structure that uh, David envisioned, but that Solomon, King Solomon, built. The sanctuary in heaven, of course, is the great original. And the sanctuary on earth is a copy of that great original. And it wasn't, of course, as I mentioned earlier, exactly like the one in heaven. And so we know from Daniel 8.14, it says the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. And so we try to understand what that means here today. What is the sanctuary needing to be cleansed? The one he's referring to is the one in heaven. 
And someone asked me last night, well, why would a sanctuary in heaven need to be cleansed because heaven's perfect? And so we'll talk just a little bit about that here. Uh, and it's a good question. We'll talk about that this afternoon. So let's talk about the cleansing of the sanctuary. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Th this, these are just thumbnails. I'm just giving you just a brief overview. Th some of these subjects require one or two messages just to get into the depths of them. The last day of the Hebrew year, does anyone know what it was called? The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And it was the last day of their year where the Hebrew, for the Hebrew people. And it was that day that the record of sins in the sanctuary was blotted out. That's really what the Day of Atonement was. So what happened? Throughout the year, individuals who had sinned, seeking pardon for their sin, they would bring uh, specified animals down there to the sanctuary. And the lamb, let's say the lamb was killed and the blood of those innocent lamb, that innocent lamb was taken into the sanctuary and there the priest ministered the blood of the, of the innocent victim inside the sanctuary. All right, so let me ask you a question. Who is the lamb and who does the lamb represent in the sanctuary services? The lamb represents Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, when John the Baptist was baptizing, uh, he saw Jesus on the riverbed and he pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Did you know that when John made that declaration, he was describing the ministry and work of Jesus Christ? What's the purpose? Why did Jesus come into the world? To take away our sin. Keep that in mind as we go forward. So here, the blood would either be dabbed on the horns of the altar inside or sprinkled before the veil. In essence, this means that the blood or the sin was transferred from the sinner to the innocent victim into the sanctuary. And there a record of the sin was transferred or made. Now the sinner was no longer under condemnation. They were forgiven. But the sin record remained until the Day of Atonement. So on the Day of Atonement, those who were truly repentant had their record of sin expunged. It was completely done away with. The unrepentant, what happened to them? Well, the Bible tells us that they were cut off from Israel. And so in, in entirety, that was the cleansing of the sanctuary. And you can read all about it in Leviticus 16 and in Leviticus 23. So when you read in, Dan, in Daniel chapter 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Every Jew reading those words understood what Daniel was referring to. It was in their system. It was in their blood. They knew all about this. They knew everything there was to know about it. They knew that it would be, there would be a day of judgment and a day where people confessed and, f and sought to forsake their, uh, their confessed sins so that those sins could be blotted out. So just to back up, on your typical day throughout the year, the priest would go into the holy place of the, heaven, of the sanctuary rather, every day to minister the blood of the innocent victim. But on the judgment day, the priest, the high priest, would go into the most holy place and there he would minister the blood of the goat on behalf of the people. So can you tell me who the, high, the priest represents in the sanctuary ministering the blood? Jesus Christ, of course. So the priest is Jesus. Jesus is our great high priest and you can read that in Hebrews 8 verse 1. What is the sum of the matter? Paul writes that we have a high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ the righteous. So what is Jesus doing up there? Of course, he's not folding his hands. He's not sitting on his laurels, as someone might put it. He's not doing nothing up there. In fact, the Bible reveals that he's far more involved with our daily lives than we probably care to think about. He's very interested in what you and I are doing. Notice these words in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, if you're ever wondering whether there is a real sanctuary in heaven, here's one verse to tell you that there is. He didn't enter into the most holy places made with hands, man's hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear, notice, in the presence of God for who? For us. So Jesus is up there for who? For you and for me. This is fantastic. He's not just, oh, let me see what the folk are doing down there on planet earth today. He's not disinterested and distant. He's very interested. He's there appearing in the presence of God for us. And that should give you and me encouragement today. Can someone say amen? Very, very encouraging for you and for me. And so we go into verse 25 and it says, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. 
So what we know is that Jesus isn't, doesn't continue to spill his blood. Jesus made the once all perfect sacrifice on Calvary's cross for you and for me. It took one sacrifice. It was complete. It was perfect. Didn't need anything added to it. Uh, it was excellent. And that was the sacrifice Jesus made. And he shed his blood once up there on the rugged cross. So why is Jesus up there in the presence of God for you and for me? He's up there seeking to save us. He's up there ministering his blood on our behalf. And so that should give us hope. That should give us encouragement here today. There's no question about that. Now, Paul goes on to say in verse 26, he then uh, then would have us have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to do what? Put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We're going to come to a very important question in just a moment. So his purpose is to do what? To put away sin. That's the high priest's purpose, to put away sin. That's why he's living. That's why he lived. That's why Jesus died on Calvary's cross. And that is why he is our high priest in heaven's sanctuary today, to put away sin. Fantastic stuff. Now we jump over to verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Amen. Amen. To those who eagerly await or wait for his for him, he will appear a what? A second time. That's referring to Jesus soon return. He will appear a second time without sin or apart from sin for salvation. Now the implications of this verse is, is big. In one verse We have here something pretty powerful. And don't miss its meaning. When it's all said and done, Jesus is going to appear without sin. And you say, well, what's so amazing about that? We already know he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. But this verse is not referring to his character. We already know that he is without sin. Paul is not cluing us in on something we already are aware of. What was his purpose? Why did he enter into heaven? To put away sin. And now he is coming the second time without sin unto salvation. So right now our high priest, he bears our sin. The sin that we send our way when we fall on our knees and confess them and come to him repentant. Which he gladly and happily receives. And so our sin is is sent on so to speak. When we stumble and fall we come with repentance and faith to Jesus. So it is this sin... That he appears without when he returns, which means something significant, if you're following along, has happened in the lives of God's faithful people before Jesus comes back. Are you figuring it out? It's interesting, isn't it? Something has happened in order for them to stop sending their sin to Jesus as their high priest. If he is coming without sin then he's no longer bearing the sin. And if he's no longer bearing the sin, something's happened in the lives of God's people that has prevented or stopped them from sending it there. The question is, how on earth does that happen? How does it happen? We go to Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, is it up there? Yes, very good. Let us hold fast our profession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our, what friends? Weaknesses. But was in all points tempted like as we are. You've got to be glad here this afternoon that you have a Jesus that identifies with you. And I'm not going to start quoting the Super Bowl ad. That, that was a poor performance, unfortunately. Maybe nice superficially, but not great. But we have a high... Now, I'm not saying that Jesus went to casinos and he went to bars or anything like that, like some of us may have done. But we have a sympathizing high priest. He's been where we have walked. He understands what it means to be tempted. He knows the allure and the pull of sin and temptation. And the good news is that he was without sin. He overcame those temptations. And the Bible goes on to say that he's able to help those who are also tempered. tempted. When tempt- temptation comes, he's able to help us and deliver us from that thing. This is wonderful news. And then it goes on to say in verse 16, Let us therefore, because we have a sympathizing high priest, let us come boldly to the throne of what, friends? The throne of grace 
because one day that throne is going to be turned into glory, but right now it's a throne of grace, that may, we may obtain what? Two things, mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus is in heaven today as our faithful high priest, uh, identifying high priest, issuing mercy for if we stumble and fall. Isn't that good news? If we trip up over, stump our toe, Jesus is there ready and willing to forgive. And when we come to him, as we, as we repent, that, repent of that sin, we fall on our knees and say, God, I'm sorry. And he issues, because it's his nature to do so, he issues mercy. But also it says that he is offering or dispensing grace to help us in our time of need. See, grace is not just God's unmerited favor. Grace is more than just forgiveness of sins. Grace is an empowering principle that enables God's people and keeps them from stumbling and falling. Now, we're not children. Uh, some of us are children here, but most of us are not children here today. Uh, we, you may not remember the time that you began to sit up straight and then you began to crawl and eventually you began to walk at, with the help of your parent and you finally got up and you started walking and today most of us are walking without the help of anyone else. Now the Christian life is similar but not the same because all throughout our Christian walk we always need the enabling grace of God. We always need the power of the Holy Spirit walking, working in us to keep us uh, from stumbling and from falling. But all too many, far too many Christians and some Seventh-day Adventist Christians are still living uh, 25, 30 years later as if they're, they're babies in the faith, still stumbling, still falling over the same thing that Jesus has offered grace to help them overcome. And that's not a condemnation. That's just a fact. But those facts should stir our hearts and cause us to recognize that what Jesus is offering us here is power, power that we've, some of us may not be aware he's offering us. Power to overcome this thing and that thing. And it's a wonderful thing that God has done for us. So we're to come boldly to his throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus comes without sin when he returns because his people today have received him today and his grace today, which helps them. And we'll develop that thought in just a quick moment. So here's what we know so far. Jesus is our great high priest. Someone say amen. Amen. He's ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. Can someone say amen? Amen. He's just there. He's there. He's cleansing the sanctuary so that there's a cleansing, if you please, of the heavenly sanctuary, the sin record of heaven. There's no sin there technically. It's in the books. And he's going to cleanse that sin record. And when did this begin? The date is secure. It started in the year 1844. That's what Jesus has been doing since 1844. He moved from the holy place into the most holy place to wrap up the work of salvation for you and for me. And that's where he is today, our great high priest. 1844, that is earth's final two-minute warning. So that's what we understand at this point. Now, I want to take you to another passage of scripture. If you turn with me to Malachi. Just before Matthew, Malachi, and we're going to look at chapter 3. And it's going to broaden our understanding of the work that Jesus is doing in heaven's sanctuary. And I think we already know that God doesn't deal in abstracts. What he does in heaven is playing out its way in our lives. Notice what it says in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. It says, for on that day, that is the day of atonement, the priest shall make atonement for who? For you. To do what? To cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So the priest was in there cleansing the sanctuary. But what was really going on? The cleansing was taking place where? In people's lives and in people's hearts. So Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. But where is he coming to in this chapter? Malachi chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Behold. I send my messenger, this is speaking about Christ, the Messiah, and he will prepare the way, sorry, before me, this, sorry, this is the messenger, John the Baptist, he'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, this is interesting. I want you to notice, it can be a bit confusing here, because I've just confused you. The, <laughs> the messenger is not necessarily John the Baptist, although you might think initially it is. I want you to notice he's preparing the way for his Lord and then suddenly his Lord is coming where? To his what? 
to his temple. Now, someone's going to say, well, yeah, Jesus did come to the temple on earth. And what did he do twice? He cleansed the temple. Hold on a second. Let's keep reading. Who comes suddenly to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap or launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He'll purify the sons of Levi. He'll purge them as gold and silver that they may offer the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers and adulterers and against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, against those that turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. All right. So this, many assume that this passage is referring to Jesus' first coming. When he came as Messiah, uh, died on Calvary's cross, he went into the temple and he cleansed the temple. He actually did that twice during his ministry. But this is not referring to when Jesus came as the Messiah. It's not referring to it at all. Uh, the Bible says, we just read, he promises to purify the sons of Levi and to make so that their offerings might be made acceptable. Did that happen in the time of Jesus? No, it didn't. As a matter of fact, that's why Jesus had to, when he came, drive out the money changers because there were some foolish things happening there in the temple. So we know it didn't happen in Jesus' day. Jesus ended up declaring in his day that the temple was left unto them desolate. God had withdrawn his presence from that temple. So these verses are not talking about when Jesus came back. So when are? What are they talking about? This passage is referring to Jesus coming to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That's what they're referring to in 1844 and his special work of purifying an end time people. He'll be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. That's what this verse is referring to. Now, this is, it's a powerful verse. We're going to come back to it in just a little bit. But I have a little surprise for you that I wanted to share with you. A little surprise. This is found in, uh, in the book, The Great Controversy, page 402 and 403. Last night, we talked about the, great, the second great Advent awakening. And I want you to notice the uh, spirit of the individuals, the, those believers who are proclaiming 1844 in that time. She says, at that time, there was a faith that brought answers to prayer. Like showers of rain upon the thirsty earth, the Spirit of God descended upon the earnest seekers. Those who expected soon to stand face to face with their Redeemer felt a solemn joy that was unutterable. The softening, subduing power of the Holy Spirit melted the heart as His blessing was bestowed in rich measure upon faithful, believing ones. Every morning, they felt that it was their first duty to secure the evidence of their acceptance with God. Their hearts were closely united and they prayed much with one another. They often met in secluded places to commune with God. And as they felt the witness of pardoning grace, they longed to behold Him whom their souls loved. Isn't that a beautiful experience? Isn't that the experience that we desire today, looking forward to the return of Jesus? It was a wonderful experience that they had. Now, here's the surprise. Speaking of those who accepted Miller's message and those all around the globe, they were so earnest and so sincere in looking for Jesus' return. Interestingly, we are told this on page 424 of the same book. But the same people were not ready to meet their Lord. And you say, what? What? I mean, how could these people not be ready to meet their Lord? They were ready for death, but they weren't ready to meet Jesus. There is a difference, and I mentioned that this morning, and we're going to unpack that here. She continues, uh, interestingly, she says, there was still a work, notice, there was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. And then she goes on to talk about what that is. Light was to be given, uh, directing their minds to the temple of God where? In heaven, Jesus wasn't coming back in their day. Their eyes were to be turned to the temple of God in heaven. And as they should by faith, follow their high priest in ministration, uh, in ministration there. 
new duties would be revealed. And another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the church. What was the message of warning and instruction that was still yet to be given to them? Well, essentially, it was the three angels' messages. Technically, it was the third angel's message. The Millerites proclaimed the first angel's message and the second angel's message, but they had, were unaware of the duty that was involved in the third angel's message, the discovery about the Sabbath and the warning with regard to the mark of the beast. Certainly, most of the Millerites were ready for death, no question about it, but they were not ready to meet Jesus when he came, was to come back. And why do you think that was? So let's think about that for just a minute. Those of us, those of us who will be alive, we pray to see Jesus when he comes back, we would have gone through the mark of the beast crisis, the mark of the beast issue, yes? Sure. We'll be required to go through the time of trouble such as never was. Were the Millerites ready for the time of trouble? Well, not according to what we just read. Their faith, sadly, a lot of people's faith faltered after the great disappointment, and a lot of people left Christianity even altogether. So were they ready for the mark of the beast issue? No, they weren't. Many of them were devout Sunday keepers. They weren't ready at that time. The Millerites loved Jesus, and they were certainly spiritually alert. There's no question about that. But the seal of God is what they needed. The seal of God was what they needed. It was so unavoidably essential in the victory in, during the time of trouble. And that seal involves intellectual and spiritual maturity. They hadn't received that at that particular time. So those who live successfully through earth's last great crisis and events will see Jesus at his coming, will know, will know what they believe. They will feel what they believe and they will do what they believe. And we're not talking simply about mere Sabbath observance here. We're talking about genuine spiritual Sabbath keeping that sanctifies and purifies a people ready to meet Jesus when he comes. We're talking about people who actually keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. That's what we're referring to here. Now back to Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 2, the first part. Who, shall, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears and so those beautiful millerites they weren't ready they weren't ready for the second coming but who can be who can be notice it goes on to say in the rest of verse 2 he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap full of soap or launderer's soap just would clean dirty wool that's what it would do it wouldn't destroy it and the refiner's fire is to make metal better not worse so don't ever take these words as something that's going to be extremely and awfully painful. I'm not going to say there isn't a little bit of discomfort, but it's not the end of the world. The idea behind this note, this, uh, these, pro these promises is that there's something better that God is wanting to do in our lives. And there's promise here. Look at verse 3. And he will sit as a refiner of fire and a purifier of silver. A refiner and a purifier of silver. Notice he sits. In other words, Jesus is in no hurry. It takes time to develop character, doesn't it? Some, some of us get a little bit impatient. Uh, and you're thinking, uh, thinking you're getting impatient with others. No, I'm not mentioning that. I'm mentioning yourself. Some of us get impatient with ourselves, but the refiner, Jesus, is sitting down to do the work. He's in no hurry. He's going to do the work if we allow him to do it. And if we allow him to do it, he's going to get the job done and he'll get a jo job done very, very well. He's going to purify the sons of Levi, it says, and purge them as silver and gold that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, you know, the sons of Levi, they were priests. And in Christ, who are priests today? You and me. We are priests today, all the children of Levi. So the purification of the priests is for who? For you and for me, the church. So in giving the third angel's message about the mark of the beast and in faith in Jesus' commandment keeping, God intends to cleanse and to purify his church. That's what he's intending to do, only if we will cooperate with him. It's a, a special part or part of his special work of purification. While he is up there doing his work, the Holy Spirit down here is doing his work in our lives. You remember when John the Baptist was talking about the coming of Jesus and he said, you know, I baptize you with water, but the one coming after me is going to baptize me with what? 
the Holy Spirit and fire. Those aren't two separate things, the same thing. And fire just as a completion of the idea. Jesus is going to come to baptize us with his spirit and fire. And then he goes on to say that he'll, Jesus will come as a win, with a winnowing fan. And he's going to thresh his summer threshing floor. He's going to fan out uh, the chaff. And all that chaff is going to go into unquenchable fire. So the idea here is that the Holy Spirit, God wants us to be baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit, in his grace, in his glory, in his goodness, to purge sin from our lives so that we will not be among those, sadly and unfortunately, that will be burned up in the lake of fire. Because God is a consuming fire to wherever sin is. So this is the plan of heaven, to get sin out of our lives. And I don't know about you, but that's good news. I don't like sin. Uh, that, that thing just kind of crawls on you and holds on to you and just keeps you going and it just, just weighs you down. And Jesus came to set the captives free. Amen. Amen to that. So let's conclude here. We're going to just see if, see if we can wrap it up. She goes on to say in, on page 425 of the Great Controversy, those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Jesus will cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Now, some people read that and they, they read that as a threat you better watch out. You better be careful. No, this is just a statement of fact. They are going to live in the sight of God without a mediator. Don't be scared. This is not a threat. It's a statement of fact. Inevitably, what's going to happen is Jesus is going to finish his work in heaven's sanctuary. Does that make sense? He's going to finish his work in the sanctuary above. And this fact is actually a promise. That means what, when Jesus is done, it means he's done what he needs to do in our lives. That's the promise. It's a wonderful promise. God wouldn't think of leaving his people without a mediator for sin as long as they needed it. That's the God we serve, a wonderful, loving God. The implication is obvious as the cross itself that God's faithful people will not need a, a mediator for sin anymore. I want you to notice what it says over here in the Desire of Ages. It says, God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. Be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This command is a what? It's a promise. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. That's a wonderful promise. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him or her from sinning. What a wonderful promise, a wonderful God. So the idea that we will live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator is a promise, but it's not a light promise. What does it mean to live in the sight of a holy God? Ellen White had this experience in the book Early Writings on page 70 and 71. She says, I saw a light coming from the glory that encircled the Father. And as it approached near to me, my body trembled and shook like a leaf. I thought that if it should come near to me, I'd be struck out of existence. But the light passed me. Then could I have seen some sense of the great and terrible God with whom we have to do. Terrible is that old English word that means awesome, great. I, I saw then, let me go on, let me change the slide. I saw then that what faint views some have of the holiness of God. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a, whole, a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary or the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. So to be like the gracious Jesus, just to be like the gracious Jesus, to be kind like Jesus, to be sensitive like Jesus, to be dependable, to be generous, to be quick to do the will of God, just like Jesus did. Oh, my friends, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. But remember, it's a promise. He shall purify the sons of Levi. It's a promise for you and a promise for me. So does living without a mediator mean that Christ's true followers will be left during the time of trouble to wrestle with temptation alone? <laughs> no. Jesus will still be their guide. Jesus will still be their guard, their stay, still their king and still their Lord, a helper in the time of need. Does this mean that God's people will have to stand through this time without the help of the Holy Spirit? 
<laughs> no. The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out just ahead of this time in freshness for the very purpose of enabling the saints to endure and go through that time. As a matter of fact, we have this in Hebrews 13, verse 5, one of my favorite Bible promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what God says. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. What a beautiful promise. We can hold on to that with all of our hearts. Now, back to the great controversy. Back to the great controversy, page 425. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. Now, we're going to sort this thing out before we're done here, this presentation. Grace and effort. Grace and effort. There's a contrast, obviously, uh, mentioned here. Their own diligent effort and the concept of divine grace. Or is there a contrast between the two? Some people worry when we talk about effort in the Christian walk, we're talking about or we're risking attempting salvation by works. But that's not what we read and that's not how we live when we live for Jesus. The passage doesn't mention works, whether good or bad. What does it mention? It mentions grace and it mentions what else? Effort. It mentions effort. So we have all, all of us have two obligations to meet. Do you know what those two obligations are? The two obligations we have to meet is to meet the debt of our own sins and to develop Christ-like character. Now, the first obligation is infinite. You and I cannot pay the debt that we owe. Our only course is to turn it entirely over to Jesus Christ who can take care of and has taken care of that great sin debt. We come to him humbly with faith and he forgives us and justifies us. Wonderful God. But character development is a little different, just a little bit different. We're talking about growing up in character, becoming more like Jesus. If character development is to take place at all, by its very nature, it involves us doing something, doesn't it? It certainly does. So uh, at the very least, you and I need to make choices. We need to make some choices. Uh, that involves obedience. To be valid and effective, our choices must unavoidably be made, must be made with our hands in Jesus' hands, with Christ reigning in our hearts. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Can't make the right choices or the good choices for the right reasons unless Jesus isn't in our hearts. He must always be there, a hand in his hand. But they are always going to be our choices, not God's. They're going to be our choices. And so we make choices with regard to the development of character. So let's try to be a little bit practical here. Do you pay tithe? You better pay tithe. Sure, you better take, pay tithe. D does some of you teach Sabbath school? Yes, some of you teach Sabbath school. Do some of you uh, get together with your families and do sundown worship? We hope and pray that you do. So you do all of these things to express your gratitude in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Sure. That's why we do these things. But let me ask you a very direct question. Who writes the checks for the tithe? You do. Angel doesn't take your hand or doesn't take the pen and write it. You do. The Holy Spirit doesn't stand up in front of your Sabbath school class and teach the lesson. Who does? You do. That's exactly right. Who takes the car to the mechanics when the, when the car's broken down? Maybe asking even the, the mechanic to do the job again because he didn't do it the first time right or the second time right. Who represents the character of Jesus to your harried and embarrassed mechanic? You do. You do. By God's grace and our own diligent effort. So we do have a part to play. We have choices to make and we choose to cling to Jesus for support and stepping out to do the right thing. Effort is required to keep and keep in mind that effort, even though it's required, is not meritorious. It doesn't earn us salvation, you see. But effort is still absolutely necessary. Notice what it says here in the Great Controversy as we wrap up this presentation, page 425. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is a special work of purification of putting away of sin among God's people on earth. This work is more clearly presented where? In Revelation chapter 4. Did you know that that is there in Revelation 14? A special work of putting away sin? It's all right there, friends. In Revelation chapter 14. 
This is the same thing that we read in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30, that he, God, will cleanse us from our sins. And I want you to notice what it says on page four, uh, the last part of page 425. When this work shall have been accomplished, and this is a promise in itself, it's going to be accomplished. The followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Isn't that encouraging news? No, no need to doubt or fret or to worry. You'll be ready. You'll be ready as long as you put your hand in Christ's hand, as long as your head is in his word, as long as Jesus is living and reigning and dwelling in your heart, you can be ready. By his grace, through your diligent effort, you can be ready. Then will the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Did I get, am I getting there? There we are. There it is. Then the church which our Lord at his appearing is to receive to himself will be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Then she will look, fair, go forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Isn't that marvelous? What a wonderful promise. God is going to have a purified church. Question is, you're going to cooperate with our, the work of our heavenly high priest. That's the question for each one of us, each and every day. And sometimes moment by moment, in the most trying moments, the most difficult uh, periods of our lives, are we going to cooperate with the work of our high priest who's in heaven? This end time call to deep, to sweet, to victorious Christ-likeness is a major part of what it means to live in the time of the end. Let us, let Jesus do that work for us. What do you say? Let us let him do the work that is needing to be done in our lives, sympathizing with our great heavenly high priest. And I think I've got a question for us on the screen. Will you let him daily purify you? So when, when he looks into your life, he sees a reflection of himself. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you've not left us without a savior, a mediator, and the powerful working of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that even though scenes are coming that uh, certainly could place fear in the, uh, even the, the most faithful of Christians, the most devout of Christians, one thing we do not need to fear or worry about, and that is if we, our hand is in Jesus' hand, and we have made him Lord and Savior, and we keep making him Lord and Savior, that we have nothing to fear for the future. We have nothing to fear then. You will see us through. We thank you for the promise and the assurance that the work that you started in us, you will complete. The promise is sure that you will receive to yourself a church without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing. We want to be a part of that, Lord. So we want to give you permission to keep doing that work in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you for that. We thank you that you are sitting as a purifier of gold and silver. We want you, when you look into our lives, to see a reflection of your glorious grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.